Hey, Java developers. Welcome to the Inside Java Newscast. I'm here in beautiful Santa Clara attending the JVMOS, a fascinating conference where some of the top JDK architects, engineers, and contributors come together to share their experiences on supporting, maintaining, and writing the JVM, the languages that run on it, and the tools that help support it. Last week, we pulled across social media all the questions you would like to ask the JDK architects. And I'm here acting as your voice to ask them about the future of the JVM and where it's heading. All right, I'm coming up on the conference center. I will see you inside. Why can't you return from a switch expression? The simple answer is simplicity. You can't return from other kinds of expressions either. You can't return from the, you know, from, you know, from a ternary expression or from any other kind of expression. And if you could, and it's, it's certainly reasonable that you could, uh, it would be more confusing to people reading the code. And we believe that reading code is the most fundamental thing uh, because having a having an expression where sometimes you return from it and sometimes you yield a value from it might, might be more confusing. But the simple answer is it's simple. Expressions get evaluated and they produce a value. So when you're running a training run, what should you consider when doing that to get the best out of Lydon for you? Yeah, so with Project Lydon, we want to do a training run so that we can observe what your application is doing. Uh, as with anything in Java, we're really good at being able to take thing, observations from your running application and use that to drive the optimizations that we want to do. So that means that the things that the training run should be doing are the things that most closely match what your application is going to be doing. So the best training run is to actually run your application in production and take the training from that. Um, if you're already doing can canary style deployments, maybe you use one of your canaries to do the training run and then you feed that information back in and we use that to, uh, to create the AOT cache. So if canary deployments aren't something that you're doing or, or don't work in your environment, then you want us to pick something that really closely matches that startup and warm up behavior of your application. Uh, so this might be running uh, an integration test at the end of your build pipeline. It might be writing a special test that just drives that startup and warm-up behavior and some of the key application classes that you have uh, in your application to get them up and running so that we can see um, what they would be doing and we can use that to drive the optimizations that we want to do. So production, of course, is always the best, but if you can't do that, something that uh, simulates that startup and warm-up behavior of your application gives us a pretty good starting point. With the introduction of value classes, do you ever see a reason for an identity-based record? Uh, why would you not make all records implicit value classes? Most records are simple wrappers for some immutable data, and it would make sense to make those value records. So that's the common case, and I'd encourage people who are authoring records to think about, should I also add the value modifier? There are cases where maybe the record is wrapping some sort of tree structure, and so it's not just a simple bit of data, but it's an entire data structure. Um, that's not a very good fit for value classes. Or uh, maybe you're wrapping some mutable data, and, and so maybe like you're holding on to a, a list that you're going to add things to in your record. Um, that's not a good fit for value classes too. So it's really two independent choices. Um, if, if you declare your class as a record, you did that because you want people to be able to see um, your state. Uh, there's no barrier between the, the fields that you store and the, the, the API that people use to interact with, with those fields. Um, and, and then for values, what it's about is whether you need identity uh, and whether uh, you represent some simple uh, data that um, is immutable and that doesn't need any of the identity features. Adding safe navigation after introducing null restricted and nullable types, optional is this way too verbose? Yeah, I think this is kind of an obvious next question after we add nullability to the type system. I certainly understand why people want it. Um, we do need to make it easy to deal with do the, if it's, this if it's null, do this other thing if it's not null. I'm not sure that the null safe operator that most people have in mind is the best way to do it. So it's something that we want to think about some more before we commit to an approach. Wait, didn't you say to meet inside, Billy? Where the heck is everybody? There, fixed it.
lightning round with a few questions that we didn't actually ask the architects. First and foremost, of course, Walhalla when? Well, when it's ready, hopefully soon, very few people want to see it more than me, trust me. But also importantly, Valhalla is no singular event. Jeb 401, which is the first thing that's probably going to land, is just one step down a road to deliver all the performance improvements and all the language features that we want from Valhalla. So it's very important not to pile all your expectations on this one Jeb and then be inevitably disappointed when can't deliver on all of that. So even after Jeb 401 lands, be patient and there's more to come after that. And then, what will happen to Java when the veterans retire? Who are the persons that will bring in the fresh ideas without sacrificing the cleanliness? So the veterans, I assume you mean people like um, Mark Reinald, uh, John Rose, Brian Getz, Stuart Marks. Without knowing their age in detail, it's probably reasonable to assume that they will retire in the next decade or two or whatever. But there's a big chunk of people who are already now leading many efforts in OpenJDK and who I think can replace them and do their work just as intelligently and deliberately. For example, Ron Pressler, Gavin Bierman, Ellen Bateman, Maurizio Cimaramore, Paul Sandoz, and I'm sure there are more that I just can't name right now. And even behind that, there's even more, right? OpenJDK is a large organization, lots of members in there, uh, so don't worry about that too much. Then, um, I didn't uh, uh, catch the precise question, I just made a quick note, and it's something along the lines of, why doesn't OpenJDK use the full workflow on GitHub with all the issues and all the pull requests there? And I totally understand the question. That would be great, right? But also, GitHub is the current platform. Before that, we had Bitbucket. Before that, we had SourceForge. In between, there was Launchpad and Google Code, I think, and lots of other things. The issue with tying a project's infrastructure to one of these platforms is that when this platform gets replaced, and so far that it happened to almost all of them, then you have to move. And that is very disruptive to a project, particularly to a huge one like OpenJDK. So it's good that OpenJDK has control of its own infrastructure as it does now. And so I personally think and hope that it doesn't actually move everything to GitHub, but keeps using its own stuff. Then I have a few questions that I want to answer even more shortly because there have already been answers to it in the past that I will link all of them in the description. So if you're interested in will native image become through JDK, unsure whether in this current form, will name parameters um, be introduced? Probably not. Brian has more details for you. What about extension methods? Again, Brian has more details for you. What's with the current state of string templates? Newscast 71 describes the current state and so far as, it's, as I know it, and it's generally publicly known, in one live stream I caught Gavin mentioning that he has ideas, that he's working on them, and that something will happen soon, TMCR. So there's that. And then finally, a bunch of questions about the on-ramp, and those actually were pretty good, also about a build tool and a format and all of that. We didn't find the right people at JVMS to bug with those questions on top of what we already asked them. But we will live stream from DevOps Belgium, and I hope to catch a few people there that I can ask that. So make sure to subscribe. And now back to the actual experts. I'd be curious to know if there have been any discussions around adding an if express into the language. Yeah, so that, that comes up once in a while. Uh, we certainly could. It's entirely reasonable to make if an expression. We already have the ternary expression in Java. So that means we would have two ways to do the same thing. And we try to avoid adding features that are just equivalent to other features uh, because A, there's not a lot of leverage there, but also B, it tends to just create discord and conflict where people argue about, you should do it this way, no, you should do it that way, and then there are style wars and that's all very unproductive. Yeah. So I, I think it's something where there's just not enough leverage. There are many examples of some older classes in Java, like date, vector, hash table, or hashtable, right. uh, where you can use them, but it's heavily suggested to not use them. So why not simply deprecate and remove those classes? Okay, removal is, I think, the easier question. The, uh, the, the short answer is those classes have appeared in a lot of APIs, both in the JDK and in third-party libraries. And that means that applications are written using those. And so old application binaries have those names in them. And so if we were to remove those classes from the JDK, all those old binaries and libraries would, would instantly break. And so we don't want to do that. Now, 
Uh, I think a uh, more subtle question is, why don't we just deprecate them? Okay, so one of the things that we've done is we have deprecated and removed several things from the JDK in the past several years. Uh, but what we haven't done as much of is deprecated things not for the intent of removing them. And it turns out that's not that valuable because what it does is it generates warnings. And if you're actively, if, if you're actively working on software and you get some warnings, okay, oh, maybe you should, uh, uh, maybe you should migrate away from that. But there's a lot of old code out there that, people don't want to put the effort into migrating things, uh, mi migrating away from the older APIs um, because it's a lot of work and it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily add any value if those old libraries and applications are working fine. So we've held off a little bit from deprecating things not for removal because it, it creates a lot of noise and work and it doesn't add as much value. Would Project Babylon and the Java ecosystem overall support differentiable programming? It could be done without making any fundamental changes to the language, for example, PyTorch. All right, yeah. I didn't think I'd be talking about automatic differentiation this morning on this beautiful <laughs> campus, but if there is a place to talk about it, this is not a bad place to do so. Um, so Babylon's going to provide the facilities to allow people to reflect over code. And from that, they can choose to do many things of it. And one example is to automatically differentiate that code. So I'm sort of punting on the problem. In some sense, I'm providing the facilities um, and the colleagues are providing the facilities to enable that to happen. But we're not going to, <clears throat> excuse me, embed um, differential programming into the platform itself. We're going to give the building blocks to allow others to do it in the ecosystem, which sort of answers that question. And then it, it's up to those in the ecosystem to apply that. Um, it's not necessarily a trivial problem either. It's actually a pretty challenging problem to implement reverse mode automatic differentiation, which is what you want to do for machine learning models. And usually you would apply that differentiation not to the sort of reflective symbolic uh, description of the Java code, but to the machine learning model that you produce from the Java. From the, the, the question about PyTorch, um, uh, because we're allowing this building block, um, we hope that at some point people will be able to use this building block as other building blocks in the JDK to build a PyTorch-like uh, feature as a Java library. And they would embed the automatic differentiation into that uh, library. Usually, my understanding is you would apply the automatic differentiation to the machine learning model and to produce a machine learning model you would translate Java code to the machine learning model and then automatically differentiate that. And so you would have, may apply it to a different kind of code than Java code, but mm -hmm. it's still the same principles apply. Is there any chance of Java officially targeting WebAssembly so that it can run natively and optimized in browsers? Java targeting WebAssembly, that is a cool trick when people pull that. I saw that with the uh, .NET runtime uh, a long time ago. Um, problem with WebAssembly is Hotspot is designed to run on a, uh, on a von Neumann machine with 64-bit uh, values and maybe some vector registers. But basically it... Um, it wants to run on, on hardware that feels real. And WebAssembly, maybe that, maybe that can be bridged over to WebAssembly, but the kinds of things that you do in, in the Java Virtual Machine as, real, as, as important primitives are low to 64-bit value from, from any address, store it, CAS it, come to a compare and swap, do vectorized operations, do bitewise operations. I'm sure WebAssembly supports this really well, and yet um, something tells me that the full semantics of modern memory fabrics are not quite there in a performant manner. And so all of the performance uh, assumptions of the hotspot backends will probably have a hard time adapting to WebAssembly. Um, maybe a PhD student should try this and see where they go, but I... I, I think they'll run into a problem where um, the kind of back-end machine assumed by Hotspot is different enough from WebAssembly that it's going to be hard. Uh, and yet, sure, why not? Let's try. <laughs> <laughs> Any spoilers ahead for Project Amber? So I, I, I would say that you know, Project Amber has been focused 
primarily on pattern matching, you know, re recently. Um, that's not necessarily by, by design, but it's just sort of how it worked out. We're kind of like reaching the end of the first feature arc with pattern matching. We did uh, type patterns and record patterns and patterns and switch. Um, and you know, uh, that sort of completed, like, the, the basic pattern matching features. Uh, the sort of next big push is uh, being able to, de to deconstruct objects that aren't just records, uh, and that's, um, that's important for a lot of reasons. It's, also, it's especially important for the marshalling work uh, that we just heard Stuart talk about here at JVMLS. And, and so I think the, the, you know, the next, next big push in Project Amber is addressing uh, idioms around object creation and deconstruction. Cool. Great. Yeah.